like I'm all for Bernie. I think that, that that campaign really opened up a lot of doors, but I think it's created some kind of sloppy thinking or some inherited tendencies where the question now is like, who's going to be the next Bernie Sanders? Like who's the next leader that we can all sort of line up um, behind when, you know, all the experiences over the past few years have sort of taught us that like one of the frustrations that we have is that like whatever you want to call the, the, the left in this country, whatever you might want to call the labor movement in, the, in this country, there's a pretty sizable gulf between the people who are its representatives and like the base. And we get frustrated a lot and we think if we just sort of yell and clamor and like, I don't think that that's wrong to be upset with people who are, you know, supposedly representing you. Um, but like if that's our, our strategy, like we're just going to lose perpetually, right? Like there has to be much more rootedness um, in, in, in these movements if we want to be able to act in concert, to act strategically, mm -hmm. to understand the the desires of, of, of people involved in these things. Yeah. and. I also don't want to like be negative. I, I always say I don't want to be negative because I do see a lot of positive things happening. Mm -hmm. Like I wrote that like just a couple months ago, you know, 55,000 um, educators in Ontario, you know, um, engaged in a strike that was deemed illegal by the conservative government. And honestly, that was a moment that like really brought everybody together and it brings and it right wing left wing whatever you want to call it people were like 39,000 is not enough for mm -hmm. uh, early childhood educator like everyone agrees on it so these ideas are actually just common sense you know um people understand people um people are also all tied together right so people are married to um paramedics people are married or mm -hmm. their families are teachers and so everybody feels interconnected and cares about this and we need to use these moments to continue more direct action as well like we need to get our unions to engage in strikes to not just do concessionary bargaining. I also think that we need to bargain for the common good. And I think we're seeing that in the US, we need to, in our agreements, we need to, in our bargaining and negotiation, we need to talk about housing because mm -hmm. it's all intertwined. Um, we need to uh, go beyond monetary items only. And I think if, if we do, we'll be the most successful, but at this moment, it still feels like there's no political will to fully organize, I feel, in Canada. And that is why I'm scared um, mm -hmm. about these right wing mm -hmm. people because they're so um, they're so confusing. Like you don't even, you know, I was talking to you about this, you don't even, and they really resonate with people about their alienation and their loneliness. Like, like the current prime minister in Italy, I was telling you about, like really scares me, you know? And I, I think that's something that that would work here. Like people would, would feel mm -hmm. like they want something like that, you know? No, I mean, I, 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 I totally agree. I mean, the, the ability of, of the right to be able to speak to people's alienation is, is um, it's, it's not good that they're able to run circles around us on that right now. I mean, I think that that's just something that the left should be able to own outright um and i think it sort of shows a, a i don't know a disconnection i think from a lot of the people who with influence and the base um and you know i i, I do want to talk a little bit more about like that alienation and, and and that and just in just one second but um one more like particular question about canada like um you know you're seeing these kind of mobilizations um from the right i mean you, you mentioned it a little bit before but like how is like the ndp um, reacting to that, or are they not reacting? Or are they not reacting well enough um, to some of these fissures and, and, and divisions and mobilizations in Canadian politics and society? It feels like the NDP doesn't react, and mm -hmm. they're very comfortable. And you know, I don't want to be conspiratorial, but I've had to think about this too. I'm like, <laughs> what is going on? Like, it, they must be just content with how things are, because. Mm -hmm because it just doesn't make any sense to me. You know, they had so many opportunities and it's like, you know, the leaders of these parties, both in provinces and federally, like, I don't know where they've been. Um, and if they are on their social media, even that's lame. It's, I'm sorry, but it's lame. It doesn't mm -hmm. resonate with people. They don't get it. Um, they're still so afraid of their own base. like. This is, and this isn't just when Amina came along, you know, mm -hmm. I had like, 
I had like communist trade unions telling me to give up on it, you know, because it's like been going on for a while and it's since been for 30 years, if not more, since they took out socialism from the constitution, you know, mm -hmm. since they purged, um, obviously the red scare and all that happened in Canada. So it's just like the party's just flat. And I think that I look at their content mm -hmm. and it's just, their slogans are just not enough. Mm -hmm. One slogan's enough is enough actually. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, no, we're just, we're, I think it's awesome. We're just going to keep borrowing from each other for a while. I think in the UK, they borrowed one of Obama's uh, slogans too for the Labour Party a little while ago. And it's just, I don't know. It's a funny thing that we're all just sort of marching towards a darker and darker future and just trading a failed strategy after, true, after and another it's like, with If you want to borrow something, borrow something from Corbyn or borrow something from <laughs> Lula. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Like, why England? Like, why Britain? I don't know. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Uh, th this is a distraction, but you might like this. Um, talking about Lula, we have uh, these, uh, a, a Brazilian friend of ours sent these to us oh, because wow. Lula was giving these speeches where he was saying that all working people deserve to have picanha, which is like a nice cut of beef. And I, I won't do my Lula impression for you right now, but he describes it perfectly. Like, he's like the fat dripping off the back and like a cold beer. And Bolsonaro shot himself in the foot, I think, with this because he printed out a bunch of free picanha Kanye cards and handed them out around uh, Brazil, I guess, to like ridicule you, Lula, but it only, I think, yeah. um, made him more and more popular. I, I definitely agree that taking some lessons uh, from Lula is something we should certainly be doing um, in the UK, US, and Canada. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, we this last week we had a, a guest on from the UK too, and um, talking about what's happening to the Labour Party um, there. And it's you know, it's interesting because I think we all sort of watch each other's politics um, and the, mm -hmm. the ups and downs. And like sometimes I'll look at the NDP and be like, well, at least it would be nice to be able to participate in politics without having to touch like the Democratic Party here. Um, mm -hmm. But as as you're saying, you know, it seems to be unfortunately you know just as flat in a lot of ways as like the larger progressive movement. I'm sort of excising the the democratic socialists from that but you know when you're when we're talking about this i mean i think it's always better to go back to like the people and go back to to the class and like you know in your experience as an organizer somebody who's thinking about these things somebody who's talking um to folks like you know we're seeing these kind of openings for the right to speak to the alienation and, and struggles that working people um, are, are, are feeling and how do you think that we can get better on the left at sort of being able to speak to that, being able to mobilize that, that frustration instead of sort of propping up the political careers of like right wing uh, charismatic folks into sort of building a better future for working people? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think we need to go back. I've been saying this. We need to go back to relational face to face organizing so if you work in some place you need to go back to trying to make attempts to meet people in person outside connecting with people um and you know building those relationships again because i think people are really lonely on their mm. on their tools and i think that um we can succeed if we give them community i think that that's what's lacking in north america is community mm and um, something deeper and stronger. And I think that once we have community and we have some relationships forms, then we can win people over to our ideas. Because like I said, I don't think people are ideologically devoted to right-wing, anti-state, libertarian, you know, hate, hate even. You know, so I think mm -hmm. that we have to go back to making those connections. And it's difficult because now people just want to be by themselves and people have a lot of social anxieties and don't want to make those connections, but we have to keep trying. Mm -hmm. And so what I mean by that is like, try to make meetings in person, try to connect with people in person um, so that we can talk about things. And then the other thing is we have to stop putting people down for having a different idea. So when the vaccine mandates were happening, we have to, to have a conversation about it. Like, you know, like make people think and give them answers. We can't just, again, patronize people. Mm -hmm. And also we have to understand regionalism or like we have to understand that, you know, if I'm from the city and I'm going up to a Northern rural area, like what are their priorities and stop putting your own priorities onto other people. I always say this, like stop assuming and then also stop assuming everything about people like sometimes mm. people go out to a rural area and they'll be like 
oh, you didn't say X, Y, Z in a right way. And it's like, well, you're first of all, assuming they don't know, they don't have mm -hmm. those experience, they're not living those experiences, but their priority right now is urgency around bread and butter issues, right? And um, I think that um, the city dominance and the dominance of sometimes the parties and all these structures, they're very patronizing to working class people and working poor people. Mm -hmm. right? And so we have to start by listening. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think like building community is, is something that like we desperately need. I mean, you know, like on a political level, but like also like on a spiritual level too. I mean, people are really alienated and like that's how you build trust and com comradeship with folks. And um, I think that, you know, the, the famous like Margaret Thatcher quote is like, there is no society. There's like individuals and families like, you know, she might have got her wish in the sense that like those really so seem to be like the few social um, blocks that we still have under under neoliberal capitalism and like building that up. I mean, sometimes people ridicule left groups for trying to do like social events that like aren't particularly about like politics, mm -hmm. you know, in like a general sense. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, I think this is exactly the kind of, of, of thing that we, we should. I don't think we should. I think it's important to walk a line and not to just basically turn things into a pure social group where like all you're doing is just like hanging out with 20 people and, and doing barbecues. Right. We need to be engaged in politics. But I, I, I don't think that we're at anywhere near a place where we've overcorrected so far that we're too social. If anything, I think we're, we're not social enough. I agree. Yeah, I think we, and I think that we're not even doing barbecues anymore. Like people <laughs> aren't even eating together anymore. You know, I, and I listening to even just the Amazon labor union and they talked about like eating together, you know? Yeah, no, those were, and like, and, and those events, um, from, from, from what I, uh, you know, I wasn't able to go in person, any of them, but they seemed like they, they, there was like a, a fun, like kind of party atmosphere to this kind of thing. And like, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, you know, we, we have to be able to, to recognize that like socialism should be like a social thing. And, um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we really need to be, be leaning into that because, look, it's not my cup of tea, but like you can see that people are having fun at some of these right wing things that are going on. Right. They're going there and, you know, they're, they're doing whatever they're doing, but they're in like a community that can feel really powerful when you're feeling really alienated. And again, like it's like it's something that we so easily could could be doing. And I think um you know, uh, as, as like members of this, especially rank and file members of like organizations and, and, and unions, the onus seems to be like, it's going to have to come from, from membership on these things because the leadership hasn't seen that they're, they're very interested in trying to build these things up mm -hmm. as, as much as they should. Um, speaking of leadership and parties, I'm reading this book right now. I thought I'd plug it. Oh, wonderful. Yes, you should. Uh, my friend, uh, Paul Prescott, um, has been yes. trying to get me to read that for the longest time. I think that that, uh, I, 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 I just ordered it. Um, you've been enjoying it so far. Oh my goodness. And I'm in New York. So I'm like, wow, like so much <laughs> history. And I'm like, where are these people? But this local like had, I don't know what, it, what's it called? Like it had a club, the local 64, maybe somebody can correct me later. Like the local had their own disco or like, yeah. like, like and like members like loved it and it was like and it was like communist and like it's just it's like it's it's a great book honestly and it talks about tony's life and i just started it but yeah i brought it to plug it into no I'm, I'm happy that you do that no we should definitely do some something on on left reckoning about that and like um another thing like anton yeager has some really great pieces in jackman about populism mm -hmm. and about isolation and uh, i think he, he wrote a review of the famous book uh, bowling alone and in it um he makes this really interesting point it wasn't so much the context in north america but in europe a lot of the left and like social democratic parties like you know you went to like a a, a barber that was like affiliated with the party like you socialize in a bar mm -hmm. and you know we we the thing is right now we're in a really rough place and i'm i'm not like a doomer or one of those people um, i'm frustrated but i'm also hopeful that's why i criticize these things because i think we can do better and i and i, I believe we can um the one silver lining about sort of being disorganized is like this is a great time to start building up those capacities and in in those communities because like what else do we have to to lose um you know i think that you know getting serious about building community and and building you know class consciousness is something that like is material it can be utilized in the short term and more importantly in the long term i think it will set us up um to be able to build strong movements that are able to uh 
um, you know, develop and, and realize real gains um, for, for working people. Because like the other thing, too, um, I don't want to keep you too long, but the other thing, too, that I'm, you know, I'm curious what you think about that I think is also tough is like, you know, you want to build community. And also, like, if you're going out of, of your community, right, if you're going from a city to a rural area, like you really have to be there because like here in Texas, like, you know, liberals from Austin have gone to rural towns forever and they've promised them a lot of really, really nice things. And people might agree with you. They might say like, oh, Medicare for all sounds good. Green New Deal sounds good, you know, whatever. Um, but that's not going to happen. And most people's experience, whenever politics comes into their life, that means that things are about to get worse, not better typically. So like there's a lot of work we have to do on the left, not just to win people over, right? Which I think a lot of people focus on, but to actually build people's trust that like, you know, when we're talking about a better world, it's something that we can actually achieve instead of me just talking about, you know, my favorite imagination of what the future could look like. I completely agree with you. And I think both of us believe in a that it's possible, but yeah, and we could go on because we saw that in the Sanders campaign, or we saw that in certain campaigns where you know they have they didn't spend enough time in communities, and then they just sent someone um, from a city, you know, again who's never even visited um, Detroit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. you blew them into to run a campaign, and you can't do that. You have to take time, and you have to. ID leaders and activists and build them so that they can do it for their community, for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that like, we have to be positive. And so I want to be positive about all this. I do really t tell organizers and activists that like, this is just a moment we're living in. And it's okay to make mistakes. Um, I read a Malcolm X quote yesterday about making adversity and mistakes. And it's like, we have to learn from those mistakes. Mm. And, and it's attached to other moments and it's attached to other contexts and situations. We're all interconnected. And um, we can't just be so inward thinking and narcissistic that it's all about this moment right now. I, th I think that's that's perfectly well said. Folks, um, the piece, there's a link below in the show notes, but if you're listening, it is uh, at rosalux.com. Uh, the right wing is organizing in Canada. Can the left learn to stop them? Y'all um, follow the lead here and we should all read the Tony book. Um, Amina, thank you so much uh, for joining me today on Left Reckoning. Thanks. So <laughs> just say it one more time because everyone went wild about the book. Um, the book is Tony Mizagi, uh, The Man Who Hated Work But Loved Labor. Um, which is uh, I knew the second I saw that it was the, the mirrored uh, feed that the chat was going to go insane. Not, <laughs> you know, the I mean, people, I think that, the, you know, people always talk about watch. You got to watch the yellow Parenti, you know, the Michael Parenti video. Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, I'd like to make read the Tony book. Um, something that we start seeing on the left, too. Yeah, I need to read it myself. Yeah. You know, Let's maybe do a good uh, LR reading series. Well, folks, uh, we're going to go well, to the speaking of game. which. What do we want to? Well, speaking of which, uh, the read, LR reading series. Yeah. Oh, you want to uh, pump this weekend? We'll be con and speaking of Rosa Luxemburg, we'll be yeah. uh, continuing our uh, Rosa reading series part three uh, this Sunday. Patreon. Yeah. So if you've if right. you've been curious about Rosa Luxemburg uh, and you've you know heard the name but you don't know much about the theory, because like I mean Rosa is already such an incredible political figure, um, but like you know is one of those characters, and it's always unique and, and powerful when you have somebody who's just as strong as a theorist as they are like a participant in politics and history. And Rose is certainly one of those people. So uh, I think we have, what, three parts up already? Was it three? I thought it was two. I think two, but maybe not. Well, I the next part. Two. I think maybe two. But anyways, yeah. both of those are now public. Um, so if you want to catch up on those, you can get them. And then for this, for the patrons this weekend, uh, we'll be doing part three or part four. We have to double check which one it is. <laughs> uh, but we're reading Reform and Revolution, which is an excellent, excellent text. Um, we, I don't know. I really love doing those re uh, reading series with you, Matt. Like it's always fun to jump back into these. Uh, yeah. And I, I really think like learning about more of the sort of experience of people like Rosa 
it, I think that's really the inoculation against sort of a do, uh, over pessimistic doomerism because mm-hmm. like things have never been easy and it, the, the hill has always been frankly pretty um uh you know titanic and <laughs> yeah. uh and you know like it's just it doesn't change the nature of like the process that we like have to go through um and uh and and i just think it like now you know, people talk about like oh the internet we're we're so exposed to stuff and that's basically the difference now with how bad things are i think yeah well, but I, I, think- I mean rose that's wild because sorry just to keep going like how aware she is of all these dynamics that we have an overabundance of inf- of oh. sort of like information on and she like nailed it through like what pamphlets and newspapers <laughs> no, you're right yeah she didn't she wasn't able to just like go on like the bureau of labor statistics and like oh, yeah. stuff back then um I really want to thank Amina. I think that that, that that's an interview I was really happy um, to to do and to have uh, put up on the main show tonight. Um, people should definitely read the piece. There's a link in the show notes um, below. You can also find it on the Rosa Luxemburg New York City uh, website. Um, we're going to go over to the post game. Want to remind folks though, really quick, um, if you like the show and you're not able to support us on Patreon, but you might want a T-shirt, uh, we're doing a 15% off sale uh, with code Last Ride. You can get that at leftreckoning.com slash store. These shirts, the LR on the road shirts are low in stock. So we only got a couple left. So if you want to get them, um, you know, you can't wait. Uh, they're, they're, they're going pretty fast. And I don't think we're going to be able to be making those anymore. Um, but folks, we're going to go over the post game. Matt's got a pretty exciting update on what's going on with landlords and the customs <laughs> and uh, traditions that i think many many americans aren't respecting so he's going to school you all a little bit on that um we're going to be visiting uh our <laughs> our nemesis buckley and um uh, and thatcher uh, we'll also be taking your calls and questions you can leave us a voicemail at 1940-289-7234 um, sign up at patreon.com slash left reckoning we'll be over in the post game in just a couple minutes um so show's not over just join us over there peace